Oh Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for being our Passover, for being our true bread, our living bread from heaven. Thank you for inviting us to keep this feast. Amen. In your uh, routine for nourishment, your eating habits, do you nibble and graze your way through the day? Or do you sit and dine? Probably a combination. Many people snack here and there, grab and go, a morsel to get them through, and then maybe at least once a day they have a substantial meal. Have you ever noticed how much of the Bible we have before us as worshipers together around this table? It's served up to us in the language of the prayers. It's kneaded into our great thanksgiving, that consecration prayer that we say right before we receive communion. It is certainly in the text of the songs that we sing and the songs that we hear and listen to already in the prelude and the praise and the opening hymn and in the gospel songs we've heard uh, from the Psalms, we've heard from Revelation, and if you were to go through those songs, you would see, you could do your little search and you would find where all these concepts of singing come from. And significant helpings, uh, helpings of Scripture in this banquet of the Word are, of course, in the readings. It is indeed a feast. We've heard from the second book of Samuel, from the 130th Psalm, from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, and from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. If I were to put the whole thing in the center of the table today, I would call it a feast signifying the reality that we cry out to God in deep need, and the merciful Redeemer is reliable and faithful to come near and to supply our need, and to save us. And the real questions that zoom through my mind are, do I recognize my needs? Do we understand ourselves connected enough to God that we can call out to God for help? If there is a real and personal connection with God, Sure, we can call out, and we can wait, watch, hope, and receive God's supplication, God's supplying and answering of our need. Uh, James has an interesting passage. He talks about the Word being a kind of mirror that we can either glance at and set down and forget about it, or that we can look into seriously and see ourselves and see the responsiveness of God in the Word, the law. He says, uh, be doers of the Word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the Word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in the mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget the, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. So I, I'm really confessing that every time we come to church, we have really more than we can eat. Uh, we've got all this stuff coming at us, but we don't have just one day to get it. Our celebration of the Word is a celebration of the Word heard and also um, experienced in the meal. A little wafer, a little bit of wine is another way of experiencing the Word. And then we go forth from here, and we're not apart from the Word, but we're seeing it enacted in our lives. So there's never a 
reason to say, well, I'm going to miss this because it's always part of you. So let's look at this too much to eat uh, um, helping that we have today. Second Samuel is a depiction of anguish, uh, grief, and loss. David is just stuck in the problem of loss because his family relations are so complicated, and he's lost his son, Absalom. There's regret that there's something I might have done and did not or could not do it, a deep lament. In Psalm 130, I know it came and went. It was too much to truly absorb, but we can look at it again. It's the depiction of despair that we need forgiveness, and we hope and we wait for it. We look from our own darkness to God, and we hope for God's mercy. We have confidence in God's mercy. We're waiting for it like the dawn watchers wait, watching for the dawn. In Ephesians, we have this desire expressed, Paul's writing. It's a desire to follow a certain course, a way to be, a yearning to be taught and trained and led into that way of being. It, too, is a kind of a cry to God to be this way instead of that other way. In John 6, we have the hunger for God, for God's life to dwell in us, to nourish us in the ways of God's being. God holds out to us the bread of life because Jesus says, I am that bread. And that bread will satisfy your hunger. I am available to you. Jesus seems to say. Now, I want to address all these series. I, I'm going to take a lightness break. My uh, professor of homiletics would say, how dare you do this? But I can't. Maybe it's the, sometimes you get, uh, you get, you want to put something in, and that's the one that Hilmer Krause said, don't put it in. If you can't stand not saying it. But as Profound as Psalm 130 is, as deep and meaningful as it is, there is a funny story about, about this psalm. There were monks in the chapel, and they were chanting Psalm 130. Now, they chant a lot of psalms. They go through it every week. And every day they have big doses. They got to Psalm 130, and they were singing along, and the officiant, probably the brother prior, was uh, singing, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for Him, and all the monks in the choir were singing. I'm, I'm on verse 4 here, verse 4 and 5. They, they chanted back, In His Word is my hope. And then he sang out, My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. And they were to sing back, more than watchmen for the morning. Oh, it was going great, except for one monk, instead of saying morning, he chanted evening. And the officiant turned around, and he says, let's try verse 5 again. And he did it again, and, and he ch this one voice sang evening. And so he's rather perturbed, and he turned around and he said, someone's chanting evening. <laughs> as ridiculous as that little story is, what Psalm 130 really gets us to is a deep hunger and need. In Psalm 130, we give voice to our own constant call to God for help and for hope. Just take a look at uh, verses 1 and 4 of Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. 
Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. And so there's two things happening here, a recognition of need and something of a confidence that we should hope because God will come. And it's hard waiting, and it's difficult hoping. And that's why we get to that, that image later that our, our, we look for the Lord like those who are in the third watch of the night are waiting for that sign that the sky is changing color, that the morning has come, and that the watch is over, and the day has begun. When the Psalms, and they do this a few times, talk about the depths, out of the depths I cry to you, they're talking about death. They're talking about the, the ocean, from, from the bottom of the ocean I cry. It, it's an image for being uh, on the brink of death. And uh, this is the kind of experience it is. So we have all been there. And this psalm is like a mirror, and we recognize ourselves in our deepest need. And it's a reminder we do have that need, and it's a reminder that we can hold out hope for the solving of it. Look at it that way. And in this uh, odd story of uh, from David's life, and David's whole story is odd. It's difficult. It's complicated. It's filled with blessing and anointing and power and victory, and it's also filled with family troubles and power struggles and uh, treachery. So if you read through Second Samuel, you're going to get a lot of the wonder of David's life and a lot of the sorrow, I mean deep sorrow, like death in David's life. At this point, his son Absalom, whom he loves, has gone astray to the point of wanting to take over the reign from David. He's gotten some terrible bad advice from Ahithophel. All the advisors are, are, are always causing trouble for David and everyone related to David. And so he starts this rebellion, Absalom does, and it, it fails. David has cried out to the commanders who are about to attack Absalom's uh, soldiers, go gently with Absalom, please, please be merciful and go gently. It doesn't happen because Absalom is up against the Ephraim forest, and he has nowhere to go, and attacks are coming from, from several directions. Now, there's an interesting piece about Absalom's doom being caused by his hair, his long hair getting tangled in the brambles, actually in the branches of the oak. And he's dangling there, helpless between heaven and earth. And that's when, not the soldiers themselves, but some of the assisting personnel surround him and kill him. Now, this is a very odd symbolic story because Absalom's hair has come up earlier, way back in chapter 14, where there's this crazy comment that there was no one in Israel about whom people thought more concerning his looks and his way than Absalom. He was the guy. And it said he cut his hair once a year, and when he cut it, it was two shekels. In other words, it was five pounds of hair. So he had this amazing, amazing hair. And it was undoubtedly part of the construct that got Absalom in trouble when people said, hey, you could be king. 
and his greatness, his vanity in his own eyes is what finally did him in. So this is a story of David's agony uh, that everything had gone wrong with many parts of his life and his family. There were power struggles, and maybe he could have done something about it, but it went wrong, and there was nothing he could do about it now. And so it's poignant when we read uh, this passage and we come to his lament. He's crying out to God, yes, but he's really speaking to Absalom in grief. And he says, oh, Absalom, my son, would that I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And so already, just looking at uh, Psalm 130 and looking at 2 Samuel, we start to look into that mirror of the Word, and we see ourselves at our most vulnerable, and we do well to cry out to God indeed. The epistle and the gospel seem to be the light, lifting, redemptive parts of this whole feast of Scripture. And we can't go as much in detail into them, but suffice it to say that in the epistle, Paul wants the Christians in Ephesus, and so we all want each other to work day by day toward showing outwardly what Christ has shown to us. We want to put what Christ has put into us, out into our behavior, our actions, our thoughts, and our treatment of others. And here's the small quote from that passage, put away from you all bitterness, wrath, and anger, wrangling, and slander, together with all malice. Put them away and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. It is humanly natural to be malicious, bitter, hostile. I recognize it. But to be instead this other way makes for a kind of heaven on earth, right in front of us and right inside of us. Perhaps we should be crying out to God from the depths like Psalm 130 does for being this other way. I don't think we can find it without divine help. We need God's grace to put away bitterness and wrath and wrangling. We need to make a long project of choosing mercy and forgiveness over retaliation. That's what David wanted to do with Absalom, but it was too late. Forgiveness needed to come sooner, earlier, and stronger. Maybe we need to make a daily meal of Christ who calls himself the bread of life, the living bread, the bread that comes down from heaven. Listen to that piece of the gospel. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. That's what he's done. Christ has fed us. Partaking of this bread daily, I believe strongly, will make us candidates for something that Christ desires for us. It makes us disciplined students, cultivating the ways of Christ in all of our human encounters. We can treat ourselves better. We can treat others much, much better. We can treat the earth and life itself with kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, and love. What heaven we shall have when we do these things. 
So yes, always, every Sunday, it's a big feast, more than we can eat. The Lord is a great host and always has food left over after we're completely sated. But the Scriptures will always be there for us, and we receive them in music, in sacrament, and in the living of the Word day by day. So indeed, we thank God. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Amen. Amen.